Great, so my name is Orly Shapiro and I'm gonna to talk to you um, about a new concept we have called a Canvas Act. So um, our vision is to eventually, essentially change wildlife conservation with new uh, technology specifically designed for tracking. Now, as everyone on this list surely knows, um, accurate geolocation is really important for us to um, have effective conservation action. As we know, wildlife move, they move uh, over great distances, and we need to know where they are uh, in order to effectively conserve them, right? So this is an example. Um, this is actually from the book. It's called Where the Animals Go. I highly recommend it. Awesome. Beautiful maps of wildlife tracking. And um, in this example, there's, um, we're in Botswana. And uh, basically in 2008, um, there were two zebras outfitted with these collars. You can see on the lower left. And these, and, we, and they were tracked over, um, over about a year. And you can see where the zebras go. They actually get stuck along these fences, which are uh, veterinary fences or fences um, designed to actually keep uh, wildlife from mixing with livestock. Um, and it actually, you know, this tracking provided a lot of useful information on, you know, where these zebras go and how they get affected uh, by these fences. Now, these uh, many years later, um, in fact, uh, WF tagged um, a few uh, zebras and um, they ended up moving all over the place, <laughs> extremely long distances, and ended up being the longest uh, recorded terrestrial migration in the world. So it's pretty surprising that before 2014, we didn't really know where zebras go or how far they move. And so I think this shows how important tracking technology is, uh, you know, for conserving wildlife. And this area happens to be in the Kavango Zambezi uh, Transboundary Conservation Area, which is a large, um, you know, conservation complex. And of course, we need to know where wildlife go um, in order to properly protect them and look at obstacles and things like this, as you see here. So, so the take home message here is that wildlife move. Um, we know that these migrations are changing because of climate change and because of human pressure. And so we need to track more location in order to uh, really conserve wildlife. So um, as most of you know, generally the existing tracking solutions out there are often too heavy, like in some of the pictures on your left, um, or they can be, they can be very expensive, uh, limiting their, um, their implementation, or they're often error prone, meaning that tags die, um, there's data gaps, um, data errors, there's low accuracy, um, or you know they just don't work long enough to really get effective data from it. So we we've heard all over you know all the gripes about um, you know wildlife tracking technology and what the problems are. So so what we aim to do here with Pandasat is we want to provide um, something completely different, and um, we're targeting uh, five different aspects here. Um, first and foremost, we want to develop a satellite-based tracking technology that provides worldwide coverage um, at a very high accuracy. Um, and we want to do this with very lightweight tags and also very lightweight satellites. These are small satellites that actually fit in the palm of your hand. Um, our tags um, can be powered by solar power, which means they can have a really long battery life and essentially last more than a year, which is currently uh, the limitations on some of the tags out there. Um, and we envision a very low price because of the low, um, the low energy usage and the low size of our system, we envision very affordable tags and satellites, uh, which makes this a very different system. And finally, this system being proposed by WF it comes from the people you know, the experts you know, that, that know conservation and wildlife on the ground. So we've estimated um, more or less 50,000 animals um, tagged um, globally. It's a very rough number. Uh, there's different ways we came about this, but let's just say that's the, that's the amount we have uh, tagged now. With something like Pandasat, we could potentially um, double that. And we, we would like to double that by, for example, tagging more than just wildlife, but tagging, um, tagging equipment or rangers or vehicles or things like that, and using that in the illegal wildlife trade. We can also increase tagging to larger scales, meaning not just in areas where we have coverage or local IoT, but we could actually you know, look at oceans or other, other places. Um, we hope to enable more replication, meaning that instead of just tagging that one or two or four zebras, you could actually tag multiple animals and see where um, enough large numbers of animals are moving. Um, we also, with our small tags, can move into smaller wildlife, such as birds. And eventually, uh, we can think about, you know, hiding trackers in shipments or, or in things to really see what, uh, you know, what are the movements and what are the marketing movements and, and shipping transactions of, of the illegal wildlife trade. 
So what is Pandasat and how does it work? Um, this is an example of what I'll call an old school or traditional um, satellite-based technology. You have your elephants here with a relatively large collar um, around its neck and a large tracking device with a big battery on it, and that speaks to a satellite. And most of the times, you know, until now, many of the satellites are large, they're expensive, and they take many years to develop and launch, meaning that by the time a satellite is already in space, it could be five to 10 years old, and it's not actually keeping up with the technology on the ground, which we know is advancing very rapidly. So with Pandasat, we hope to introduce very, very small tags, size of a penny, um, with very low cost, um, very small antennas that could potentially reduce um, the invasiveness of, of tagging. So I have an you know, example here, could be an ear tag um, and an elephant. You could change the tagging mechanism and potentially you know, tag more wildlife. Um, next, uh, we have the Pandasat. As I said, it fits in the palm of your hand. It's extremely small. It's, it's an order of magnitude smaller than some of the satellites that are up there and also a very low material cost. And what happens is when you have multiple satellites in a fleet, you can increase your coverage to not be limited to only when the satellite overpasses, which, you know, with multiple satellites, you could effectively have global coverage, you know, in real time. So the Panasat concept uh, includes then collecting the data from wildlife, um, sending it back to a CubeSat, down to a ground station, and then um, becomes a period of data enrichment and usage, meaning you can combine your tracking data with local information from experts, um, just like the camera, as we saw, uh, from Eric. Um, you can include earth observation imagery, climate data, socioeconomic information, uh, future plans and scenarios, and all that can be processed in the cloud with data analytics that we're all well aware of. And we can put that data out very, very quickly to community stakeholders, decision makers, and, and anyone who can really implement real-time action. So we've identified a wide range of use cases uh, for Pandasat. I'm only gonna focus on the wildlife conservation aspect, but you know, there's other potential out there. And uh, mostly we've identified four kind of major aspects, um, human wildlife conflict, obviously getting warnings or knowing where uh, species are moving when they get uh, in proximity to humans, um, anti-poaching efforts, uh, clearly you can use tracking to know where your wildlife are, but also potentially know where your rangers are or where your your community um, is intervening. Conservation planning, um, if we were able to you know, better know where wildlife are moving in time and space, we can actually protect better, know where corridors are, um, and, and reduce the, uh, the conflicts uh, with species. And finally, scientific research, as we all know here, um, knowing where, where wildlife goes is, is extremely important to just knowing more about them. So one of the, we've identified many case studies and one of the specific ones to come out of the WWF network are the great parrots. Um, if you don't know about them, they're very intelligent talking birds. Um, they are uh, becoming endangered and they, they live in the central Congo basin. And the issue is that we find them in markets all the time. They're being sold as pets. I mean, you probably know someone who has one as a pet. Um, so they get captured, sold at markets. And uh, what we do is we often find them in markets and we will release them. But right now we have no real way to actually see where they go. So we release them, we don't know where they nest, we don't know where they reproduce, we don't know where they spend their time. So, they could, so it's really not um, effectively helping the project, the problem. If we could actually tag every, every gray parrot that we release, we could go see where the nests are and then we could have more effective action to actually protect their, their habitats and prevent them from being captured in the first place. So we know there's a lot of alternative solutions out there and I'm eager to talk to you um, about your experiences. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a bit of a crowded space, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to position Pandasat as a lightweight and global coverage um, sensor. So as lightweight as possible and as global coverage with this fleet of satellites, but also at a relatively low cost, some, something like the IoT devices. And we have a, we've assembled a great team. Our Pandasat team right now consists of Zach Manchester. You might've heard him. He's launched what's called the Kicksat. Um, it's a tiny, tiny satellite that he crowdsourced and, and launched as part of his PhD. Um, and he works with Rob McCurdy, who's a very well-known tag, um, small tag and robotics designer. And he's been developing some of these small tags that can talk to the satellites. Um, I'm in Germany at WWF and I'm um, assisted by Sam Harper, who's our head of global business systems. Um, at WWF International, who's kind of developing the, the marketing and business aspect. And Robbie Kapoor is our uh, space expert and our space sector expert sector expert who's helping us, you know, develop more of these, uh, of the satellite uh, component. 
And, um, and yeah, and during the Wild Labs Tech Hub, we were supported by the satellite applications catapult, um, which helped us really um, refine our idea. And so this is where we are now. Um, we're currently in the R&D phase. Unfortunately, we don't expect Pandasat to be you know, working in the next, for the next year or at least two to three years. Um, but we have built a prototype that you see in the lower left and that was built by some nice students at Stanford um, in, a, in a robotics or sorry, in a CubeSat class. So the first Pandasat has been built. We have some small prototype tags that we've actually tested in the field. Um, Zach and Rob uh, went out in, in Colorado, uh, lots of kilometers apart had a tag and simulated the satellite and was able to look at the accuracy and the power budgets um, of these tags. So we're looking at really promising results. And then we expect to have um, some pilots, pilot uh, applications, scale and public launch, and eventually some commercialization or actually getting Pandasat going as a you know, startup entity. So, I mean, what we're looking for really, as I said, we're in the R&D phase. Um, we are we are here, we're looking at Wild Labs. If for any tag development partners, I'm sure you know best how to, how to adapt small tags um, to specific wildlife cases. And we're supremely interested in new use cases and adapting the tags to that. I don't know if there's anybody out there who's planning on rock, uh, launching, launching a satellite, sorry. Uh, but if you wanna take a Pandasat with you, we can arrange that. We're happy to hitchhike into space. Um, and I know a lot of you are using AI, value-added analytics. Um, we're looking for lots of cool ideas on how we can actually use this data when we have real-time data. How can we combine it with other data to, to come out with really good decision-making tools? And finally, anyone who has an idea or potential customer wants to use Pandasat, we'd love to hear from you. And we hope that when we launch Pandasat, it'll effectively allow us to tag more wildlife, track more wildlife, and give us more technology for, for illegal wildlife trade and allow us overall to generally make better conservation and decision actions. So let's work together to change the technology out there for, for wildlife conservation. And thanks for joining us. And we have a new website. <laughs> and I'll take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, we had a question come from Isla um, while you were speaking. And she was wondering, um, doesn't have a mic with her, but uh, she was wondering, um, can you explain how, or d explain how these tracking chips will compare with Icarus tags? And I think I'd kind of be interested to see how, to hear from you how it fits in with the landscape of tracking um, technologies. Well, you've sort of explained that, but how it fits in with like, there's a lot of emerging projects happening at the moment. So how it fits in with all of them. Yeah, so Icarus, um, as we've shown in the comparison slide, offers small tags. Um, the main difference um, is, as you know, when you're doing wildlife tracking, you have to decide on a trade-off. That trade-off is either size, it's either data, it's either accuracy or some of those things. So um, Icarus has a lot, will collect a lot of data, yes, um, and um, send it back to right now what is only one antenna on the ISS. So that limits, I guess, the amount of coverage you have. Um, so you can't exactly get, you know, always real time. And you have to wait till the ISS passes over your tag. And you also have these, um, it's collecting a lot of data. It's very, let's say, more data heavy. We're, um, we're looking at a very, very less is more approach with a much smaller satellite, many more satellites to increase coverage, and this much lower power budget. So we're not sending any additional data like velocity or anything like that. It's a, it's a very simple, simple chip. So that's the main, um, main difference. And what was your other question? Sorry, Stephanie. Um, so there was, there was one that came through from Simon Taylor, um, who was wondering what sort of latitudes um, Pandasat would cover and and how are you planning to um, fund the launch and the operations of the satellite constellation? Sure. Um, and so that's, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the, the final. So that's, so that's the thing. So yeah, so Icarus is limited by its orbit because it's on the ISS. It's limited to about 55 degrees north or south. We would launch these into a polar orbit, meaning they, they cross the poles uh, several times a day so that your coverage is actually much more frequent at the poles. Um, slightly less at the equator. And then that's one of the things we threw at the satellite applications catapult is um, show us what orbits we need because we basically we're hitchhiking into space, right? We're going wherever they'll take us. Um, show us which orbits we need to get real time and what is the optimal number of satellites and orbits to have basically at any time one satellite passing over. Um, so that's why how we aim to get the global coverage. Now, as for the launches, um, we're hoping, uh, yeah, our, our good idea and our, our nice idea um, will allow us to have a cheaper or more affordable or perhaps a free launch and allow us maybe someone wants to take us, like I said, as a hitchhiker, um, or we can even be flexible in our satellites that we could just maybe have a sensor on board and then someone else is launching a satellite, we could put a sensor in their satellite 
Um, it could also be very modular. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, but we have uh, some strategies for launches, and there's actually a lot of funding out there, including from the satellite applications Catapult, um, supporting launches. So you can um, get launches out there. What, one of the things I really enjoyed about the um, event last week was um, that that request was not like did not cause any surprise and actually came back with a couple couple of like oh yeah we could help with that um totally the thing is people are launching stuff all the time and uh exactly so there you could actually go online right now if i had a satellite built i could go online right now and order a launch and just pay for it with my credit card and that's it like that's so crazy. Far now <laughs> so the space uh, technology is changing we had one more question um about it's more technical um what are the advantages of pan what are the advantages of Pandasat over the usual GPS trackers? Yeah, so the mostly it's going to be your data and power budget. So a GPS, um, first of all, needs, um, it needs to start up, it needs to get there, and it needs to usually triangulate with three or more satellites, right? And that, that takes up a lot of power. Even just consider the, you know, the GPS on your phone or your normal GPS needs to be um, charged a lot. So those GPS trackers usually require quite a bit of energy. Our system only needs to see one satellite and it's designed to be extremely low power. So in order of magnitude, lower power than a GPS, meaning that um, it could run on a little solar power um, panel or it can run on a very small battery for much longer and you won't run into those power issues. 